Welcome back. We're going to take a look at US affairs now ahead of Barack Obama's visit to the Asian region over the coming week. He is visiting Japan, China, South Korea and Singapore. There are a number of issues on the plate for the US president and to take a look at them and how the lay of the land is looking in US politics at the moment. Joining us now from Sydney, two members of the US Studies Centre there in Sydney, James Morrow and Associate Professor Brendan O'Connor. Thanks both for joining us. Uh, James Morrow, first to you. Barack Obama uh, making this visit. Hillary Clinton, we know, has been in the Asian region uh, often as well. Do you think the Obama administration is showing more engagement with the Asian region than, than George Bush? Well, that's a tricky question. I mean, certainly George W. Bush got a lot of uh, bad rap for a lot of his foreign policy. Um, people said that he was not as engaged with the Asian region as much as he should have been, especially with all of his uh, wars in the Middle East and so on and so forth. However, uh, the question is, you know, is, there, is he being more engaged? I think, yes, he is. But is this leadership? I think we need to wait and see, because there's a real question about whether or not uh, Barack Obama's foreign policy, as he's articulating it both in Asia and around the world, is one of American leadership or one that is going to step back and let other countries such as China take a more active role, something which makes a lot of uh, our allies in the Asian region nervous. And I think that's something that we need to keep a very close eye on as he does this trip and then goes forward with his presidency. Well, Brendan O'Connor, what are the big challenges that you see in the region uh, for Barack Obama? Do you think he's making progress on them? Well, he, his first stop is Japan, and I suppose there's a reassurance process going on with Japan. That was Hillary Clinton's first overseas stop. Then he's off to APEC and then to China. And obviously, the big issue with China at the moment is a potential trade war. The United States has just put a 35% tariff on Chinese tyres, and that wouldn't, if that was followed up with other tariffs, this could be a very sort of negative process between the two nations. So I think there'll be a lot of reassurance in China saying, well, maybe we've got to do this to shore up jobs. A lot of jobs have been lost in the tyre industry. And then he's off to South Korea, which is a nation which has had a, a little spat with its uh, northern neighbour in recent times. And the United States will want to again show that it's engaged in the process in the, in the Korean Peninsula, but also wanting to draw China into that process. So I suppose there's um, going to be a sense of US wanting strong bilateral relations, which George W. Bush tended to emphasise and also multilateral relations. They look for some kind of regional architecture of a type. James, whether, he, uh, whether the president pays a, a surprise visit to Afghanistan or not, we don't know on this trip, but clearly it's going to be on his mind, the issue of uh, troop numbers. Now, uh, he is under pressure and being pulled in different directions on whether to increase troops there in Afghanistan. We are expecting within weeks uh, some sort of announcement from the president on this. What do you think he should be doing? Because it seems the uh, US military commander in Afghanistan is calling for 40,000 more troops, but the US ambassador there not so sure. Well, you know, let's, let's be clear about a few things. Number one, the question of whether or not he visits Afghanistan. I mean, as Kevin Rudd shows us, pretty much no world leader with troops in Afghanistan can go within 3,000 miles of the place without actually dropping in and having a visit. <laughs> On the question especially of, before Christmas. Especially before Christmas or, you know, Remembrance Day or anything like that. Yes, absolutely. Um, beyond that, though, uh, you know, let's remember, first of all, the ambassador, while he has a lot of, uh, you know, insight into the ways various tribal factions are playing out in Afghanistan, he doesn't any troops. You know, General McChrystal, who is the commander of the forces on the ground there, and who has argued for much larger uh, troop commitment if, in fact, we are to root out the Taliban, if, in fact, America is to secure something like a victory in this country, um, he's called for many more troops. One word is attaching itself to Barack Obama right now when it comes to Afghanistan, that is dithering, and this is a very dangerous thing. He's essentially keeps kicking the can down the road, refusing to make a decision. So he just said he's not going to accept any of the plans that have, been, that have been put forth to him. Meanwhile, people are fighting. People are dying in Afghanistan. Allies are considering whether or not to uh, pull out their own troops because America is not showing enough leadership. He really, really, really has to focus on this international problem now and I think make a serious commitment or get off the pot and get out. He needs to pick, uh, pick what he's going to do. He's almost doing a reverse LBJ, where LBJ got criticized for calling uh, bomb strikes for from the White House. He's sitting in the, in the White House refusing to call any sort of shots. Uh, Brendan, do you agree with James there that this, uh, this represents dithering from the president or do you think it's, it's more a contemplating and taking his time to weigh the, uh, the decisions? It's a wicked problem. There's no solution that's going to be perfect. So committing another 40,000 troops seems to me to be going too far, that there's not going to be able to be uh, very much success in Afghanistan if the Karzai government proves to be as corrupt 
as many people think it is. This is the ambassador's problem. The US ambassador is saying, look, we cannot really engage with a government that doesn't function in a way that's going to be sensible to build up uh, capacity in Afghanistan. So I think there's no, there's no good solution here. And the question is, why would he want to overcommit for a long period of time, which McChrystal was suggesting five to ten years? So I suppose it's just a sense of there's no easy way out. Uh, he's in some ways built this up rhetorically himself in his campaign, talking about Afghanistan as the good war as opposed to the bad war in Iraq. And I think he's stuck in a very difficult position. And if he was to reduce troop numbers, uh, some would say he was going back on election pledges. I've got to ask you both about the big story in the US, of course, over the last week, and that is the, uh, uh, the, the, the shooting, the, uh, well, the, the shooting in, in involving uh, the Fort Worth base there. The Army psychiatrist Nidal Hassan has now been charged with 13 counts of premeditated murder. Now, these deaths have really rocked the US. Um, uh, Barack Obama's ordered a review to determine if any of the, the warnings should have been picked up on about his contact with radical Islamic with a radical Islamic cleric James what's this done to uh, religious tolerance in the United States uh, do, you, do you see any shift here and particular sensitivities about Muslims in uniform well David I think that really what this is uh, the real tragedy here is that all of these deaths were from what it looks like completely preventable and uh, and that they were uh, that these people who died here were sacrificed on the altar of political correctness you know the progressives and the left in America is always worried that there's going to be some Muslim backlash that never occurs but in fact you know this has led to this uh, attitude where people have to tiptoe around Islam in the army in other walks of life and no one is willing to connect the dots when they see somebody like this guy who actually went and gave PowerPoint presentations to his colleagues about uh, about jihad and about the need for Muslims to fight what they perceive as crusaders. Nobody really wants to say anything because everybody was too sensitive and it had a tragic, tragic end. I don't think anybody would, you know, take this and say, well, all Muslims, uh, you know, should not be allowed to serve in the military or anything like that. But people do need to be willing to take the warning signs when they're there, when it involves, you know, a religion or anything else. And I think that's the real tragedy of this case. Yeah, well, Brendan, it does. It has uh, touched on some uh, sensitive issues, this whole case. Do you think Barack Obama himself has handled the response that he's made appropriately? Some people have suggested his Fort Hood speech that he gave uh, the other day was one of his best speeches ever. It struck me that the themes in the speech were very similar to the themes that George W. Bush actually spent a lot of time talking about, that America was a country that wanted to expand freedom and liberty in the world. It was a classic kind of American exceptionalist speech in some regards. So I think it in some ways suggests that there's a great deal of continuity on the war on terror frame, and that would suggest what Barack Obama might do in Afghanistan is increase troops, that the sense that this war will still be sort of attempted to be prosecuted in Afghanistan, uh, somewhat on the border of Pakistan as well, and that this is a real continuity between the two administrations. You just look at the number of people being killed or the number of drones in the Pakistan-Afghanistan border region, you can say that there, there's a tremendous amount of continuity, even maybe uh, uh, an upping in uh, America's effort to prosecute the war on terror. Yeah, look, uh, sadly time's got away and it's a lot more I'd like to discuss with you both. I think, I think we should do this again, do this again soon. But uh, Brendan O'Connor and James Morrow, good to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. No problem.